whether you want to know it or not. An introvert is the one who's thinking, no way I'm going to tell you how I feel unless I really trust you. An introvert is oriented to thoughts and emotions much more than to people and events on the outside. So this is your introvert, this is your extrovert. Introverts have slower reactions to things. They're processing things inside. And they'll only disclose how they're feeling when they're comfortable. Extroverts like to act first and think later. So you've seen these signs, safety first. No, it's act before you think. That's often what, what clerics and sanguines like to do. They'll talk before they listen. They want to respond actively in action and they will tend to be more warm and friendly, at least initially. Introverts like to think first. They follow the sign. They follow the rules. They listen more than they talk. Actually, my daughter Mary, who's here today, is uh, a very extroverted, far more extroverted than, than me. And uh, I said, yes, God gave you two mouths and one ear so you could talk twice as much, much as you listen. And she's like, what, Dad? I said, no, that's just you, Mary. Uh, because sometimes it seems like that way. Uh, introverts respond internally and passively. So they're not going to stir the pot very much. And they're slow to warm up to you. Extroverts process things by talking. Introverts process things by thinking. So I'm married to an introvert wife. I have learned this, guys, again, this is more pre-marriage advice. If, or, or with girlfriend, for that matter. If your girlfriend's an introvert and you're an extrovert and there's a, a problem in communication, uh, for the first 20 years of my marriage, I would follow my wife around the house talking until we could work it out. It never happened. She needed to be alone. I finally figured that out. I needed to talk, but I had to wait till she was ready to talk. So some people are not, and it doesn't mean they don't like you. It means they really have to think it through. So extroverts like to process by talking. They're refreshed by social interaction. So they feel energized after spending time with people. Although clerics need more time alone than the sanguine does. The sanguine doesn't need much time alone. Introverts process by thinking. Yes, like this little guy here. And they are drained by intense social interaction. In our community, there's a new order of uh, Franciscan brothers. They're barefoot. They wear wool. They don't handle money. They sleep on the floor. They beg for their food. Well, we have them over to our house every Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. And my wife loves doing this and preparing for it. And when they started, there were eight of them. Now, at Christmas, we had 35 of them over to our house. And they're over for about eight hours. And my wife loves doing it, but she is absolutely, totally drained the next two days. She has no energy. It takes a lot out of her. Introverts are more aware of themselves and how other people see them. Extroverts are usually blind to how other people see them. And then determining temperament, not only based on extrovert or introvert, is are you more oriented naturally toward people or principles? I'm not saying one is right or wrong. It's just what's your natural inclination? Those who are people-oriented make decisions primarily based on how they will affect relationships. It's just your go-to mode. It's the natural way you think. They seek harmony and peace. They like tact over truth. That means that they want to say things in a nice way to people is more important than telling somebody the truth, if the truth will hurt. They're more adaptable and cooperative with other people. So in, in group projects, they're the ones who will go with the flow and, and be fun to work with. Those who are principle-oriented make decisions primarily based on whether it matches what they think is right or wrong with not as much concern about how it affects relationships. Of course, we're all concerned about both things, but they are more naturally concerned about how it affects certain principles of right and wrong. They are um, uh, oriented more toward goals, ideas, and ideals than relationships, and they prefer truth over tact. They think it's more loving to tell some of the truth, even if it will hurt them. And they are less flexible. They like things more scheduled out, more planned, whereas the people-oriented ones will go with the flow if it'll help with relationships. So now to the four temperament types. This is one of the big shortcuts to figure out yours or someone else's temperament, although taking the, the, the quiz will help. So the response to the stimulus, this is the classic way. If you react strongly and quickly to things, you're probably going to be a sanguine or choleric. If you respond slowly or weakly right away, 
you're going to be a phlegmatic or melancholic. If you have a short reaction, you're a sanguine. Um, that's a fast short. And then a slow short reaction is the phlegmatic. The fast, long-lasting reaction is the choleric. And the slow onset but long-lasting reaction is the melancholic. So that's the classical basis of temperament theory, and it's wired in, in our genes genetically. Now, what I just went through, the extrovert, introvert, and the people or principle-oriented, this is the simple two-by-two two matrix. A people-oriented extrovert is called the sanguine. That's a happy-go-lucky, up and down. Uh, the people-oriented introvert is the phlegmatic. The principal or project-oriented extrovert is the choleric, and that's me. My wife says I always have, you know, a hundred projects that I'm trying to do. And then the principal or project-oriented introvert is the melancholic, and that's my wife. Now, using the animals, the melancholic would be the beaver, the phlegmatic, the golden retriever, the sanguine, the otter, the choleric, the lion. So, you have a question? So the, the shortcut to, uh, to knowing this, and we're going to talk about what are some of the, the natural good points or strengths of these people and what are some of the natural weaknesses. Well, when I go through this, if you look at the list of all these different uh, virtues or good habits, whatever one is the hardest one for you is probably belongs to your opposite temperament. And we'll show you that. So... Uh, how many people belong to each of these types? Well, according to one study, there, there's something in the United States that businesses use called DISC, and that's dominant for choleric. Uh, the, uh, this one's the sanguine, this one's the steady phlegmatic, and this one's the compliant melancholic. Oh, that's an influencer. But it still goes to the four. So they say that only 14% of people are melancholic, 40% are phlegmatic, 28% are sanguine, and 18% are choleric. But this is even better. There's a website called Catholic Match for Catholics who are trying to meet other Catholics in the United States. I actually have friends who've gotten married because of this. And they use the temperament quiz in trying to group people up because you typically do not want to marry someone of the same temperament for a number of reasons. You'll drive each other nuts. <laughs> um, about a quarter of people are melancholic. Only about one in six or seven are phlegmatic on, on this. Over a third are sanguines and about a quarter are cholerics. So, and how do they fit male and female? Pretty similar, but by far there's more sanguine females, so there are a lot of happy-go-lucky women out, of the, out there. And uh, there's a lot of serious uh, men out there, too. Over half of men are pretty serious. You've already figured that out. And men are different than women. Uh, so, my family. I have seven children. Well, God gave us three melancholics. My melancholic wife, uh, this daughter who's going to graduate from college this year, and one of my 10-year-old twins. We also got three cholerics. So, uh, my oldest son and my daughter, Mary, who uh, will be having a lunch here. She's over at Shepherd's Fields right now. And then we got three sanguines. Uh, and they're the best adjusted ones in the family. They're always happy. It's great. And so God gave us no phlegmatics. The only phlegmatic we've ever had is uh, we had a great uh, golden retriever once. He, he was so phlegmatic. This is Mary when she was three. Uh, he would even let her fall asleep on him in the back hall and wouldn't move. My wife always wanted a phlegmatic, and we never got one. Because we'd go to church, and you see these families with all these kids, and they'd always be sitting there, you know, not moving, behaving, and our family was a mess. Uh, and she's like, how do I get a family like that? Once we understood the temperaments, they were born that way. In fact, it's kind of funny. There was another family in town with seven kids, and they were one of these perfect families. You know, they, they always behaved, looked like, yep, they, they were listening. And the mom thought that my wife was a horrible mother because her first son is very choleric, very, you know, had to be always moving, touching, doing something. And, and years later, she came up to my wife and said, you know, I have to confess that I used to think you were a bad mother because of your son. Well, after her seven kids, she adopted a, a boy from Vietnam. And Vaughn was very choleric. And she finally realized that it wasn't her that was the great parent. It's just the way her kids were born. So 
as a parent, it really, I wish we had known this when our children were born. We didn't understand the temperaments then. But there are, there are some types that are much easier to read. Then my, my daughter, in fact, my daughter here, our second born, was uh, two days old. She just brought her back home. And my wife called the, the nurse and said, there's something wrong with my daughter. And she goes, well, well what's wrong? Well, we've been home, and all she's doing is sleeping and eating and filling her diaper. And that's it. Uh, and the nurse said, ma'am, that's what babies are supposed to do. And she goes, but my first one, didn't he cry for the first six months? And he did. He cried, for, he cried across the United States as we were moving from the East Coast to the West. So we didn't know that kids could be enjoyable, you know, when they're young. Okay, each temperament has a key emotion. The melancholic's key emotion is fear. They're afraid of a lot of things. And there are often things that you should be concerned about, but often they'll be maybe a little too worried. The key emotion for the phlegmatic is actually no emotion. They don't have emotions about much of anything. And like I said, they're the ones who don't know what's going on inside, but they make great diplomats and peacemakers. And you'll see some of their strengths. The key for the sanguine is optimism. It'll all be all right. It's going to be fine. Why will it be fine? I don't know, but it is. <laughs> they're, they're the ones with the longest and best stories of the sanguines. You know, everything that I could tell in about 30 seconds, maybe 30 minutes for a good sanguine. And it would be a lot funnier. And half of it may have even happened. And then the key anger for the choleric is anger. It's easy to anger a choleric. Each has a key need. The melancholic to fulfill high standards. They have the highest standard of any type. Everything should be done just right. And one of the key lines for my wife or any melancholic is if they see you doing something, uh, you're doing it wrong. Here, let me show you the right way to do it. So there's, yes, at home there's always dad's way to do it and the right way to do it, which is usually mom's way. Uh, the phlegmatic's key need is to serve others. They always want to be there for others. They're very other-centered. They're not usually very selfish at all. The sanguine's key need is frequent social interaction. They've got to be around other people. So to them, the worst punishment in the world is solitary confinement. My wife, the melancholic, she would love to be punished with solitary confinement. Can I be punished and sent to my room? She would love that. And the choleric's key need is to direct others. That's the bossy part. Each has a key goal. Melancholics is to correct others if they're doing something wrong. Uh, the phlegmatics is to act traditionally, not rock the boat, be the way I'm supposed to be. The sanguine is to be recognized as an important social person. And the clerics is any personal challenge. I, as a cleric, I always have to have some challenge I'm overcoming. I can't just sit and be very long without forcing myself. The melancholic's key fear is being criticized. I can't do anything wrong because I'm out telling other people what they're doing wrong. The phlegmatic, losing security is a big fear for them. They just want to be safe secure, happy. The sanguine, social rejection, to not be liked by your friends, that would be horrible. And the cholerics is being taken advantage of. So, have you ever, any of you ever seen The Far Side? It's, uh, it was a comic from the US. Well, anyway, this is a far side, and this does the best job of describing the four temperaments. You've got your, your first gal up here. The glass is half full. That's the sanguine, always looking on the bright side. The melancholic, the glass is half empty usually looking on the dark side. Then you've got the phlegmatic, half full, no, wait, half empty. What, what was the question again? <laughs> and then the choleric, water. Hey, I ordered a cheeseburger. He's mad. So uh, th it works for me. OK. The, now, when we go through weaknesses of temperaments, they're not moral weaknesses. They're just the way we are born, and we have to work harder to overcome those weaknesses. So let's look at each of the temperaments now. What are the strengths of the cleric? Cleric is usually naturally intelligent, has a lot of energy, uh, can think independently, and uh, perseveres uh, very strongly. So, and, and this, the, these um, slides, I've asked Shahinda to make available if uh, any of you want to go and review this later. So I, I won't bother reading everything to you. Other strengths, action. We're People of action. I love this picture, this little guy. Success, oriented towards success, sometimes at whatever cost. But they're usually, they grasp the big picture. They can uh, plan things. They're very self-motivated. You don't need somebody else to motivate a cleric. You need someone to point them in the right direction, though. 
and the Choleric gets more done than any other type in terms of projects. Weaknesses, always in a hurry. And we think impatience is a virtue. So, uh, yeah, they were talking about Arab time here. I would have a, I've had a horrible time when I travel to other countries where the, the clock is an option. Um, weaknesses, uh, I'm right and you're wrong. You know, and uh, we hate meetings. Meetings drive us crazy. And we can have short tempers. Uh, and we don't like small talk, uh, typically. Talking about the weather only gets so far. But I think God made me a doctor because I have to talk to my patients and get over a lot of these uh, tendencies of mine. And oh, the bottom one, tend to make rash judgments. We'll make judgments too soon before we really have enough information. Other weaknesses, I'm not insensitive, I just don't care. Insensitivity, uh, hard-hearted uh, bossiness and uh, uh, tendency toward anger. And cholerics tend to fear intimacy. So it's hard to be, uh, have emotionally intimate friendships. And we can be dictators. The melancholic. Strengths of the melancholic, they're usually calm, very compassionate, thoughtful and reflective, and have a great sense of justice. And they strive for ideals. They're very careful and thoughtful about everything. And this is my wife. And these characteristics you know, really attracted her to me. They're consistent, incredibly loyal. In fact, my, my wife keeps saying, yeah, you st I stuck with you because I was loyal. Because we dated for almost five years before we got married. I was a slowpoke. I know. They're wise. They're persevering. Uh, they're very dependable. And I think my wife's picture is in the dictionary next to our responsibility. She is so hyper-responsible, it's incredible. She never lets me down. Now, weaknesses. They don't want to take risks with anything. They're easily frightened or worried. They're skeptical of anything new. They can be very judgmental and slow to forgive. They think too much before making a decision. They're the ones who just can't make up their minds. Well, on this hand, this might be an idea. On this hand, I think I'd do that. And then they keep running out of hands. And they have to, my wife has to use my hands, my kids' hands, to try to make up decisions. And the more I think, the more confused I get. They can think themselves into this circle where they just can't make a decision. They can have a bad attitude, too, um, easily. And they can be very fussy. So. And they sweat the small stuff too much. The sanguine, the strengths of the playful otter, they live in the present better than any other type. So when they're with you, they're focused on you. Whereas the cleric is often thinking ahead, the melancholic's thinking of what happened wrong beforehand. The sanguine, they're all there with you right at that moment. This is sunshine in a bottle. In fact, on the trip, my daughter Monica, who's completely and utterly sanguine, gave me this prayer list to pray for while I'm on pil pilgrimage. At the bottom of it, she has a little bottle with a ray of sunshine because when she was two years old, she kept telling people, my name isn't Monica. I'm sunshine in a bottle. <laughs> and that was her name. And she is. She's always smiling. So that's her nickname is sunshine in a bottle. And she even signs it with me now. They're very creative. And they're generous as can be with themselves, with their things, because it's all about relationships for them. Uh, and they're very eager to please others. They don't want to get people angry. They're smiling. They're usually happy, have a good attitude. They want to go on an adventure, you know, just like Bilbo Baggins here. Uh, and they're quick to forgive and to seek forgiveness. Because, again, what's it about? Having good relationships. They have lots of energy. My daughter, are you familiar with jump rope? Yeah. Okay, in, in my area, there's a competitive jump rope team. She is one of the oldest members, one of the best members of the team. She can just go and go for hours and hours. It's incredible. Lots of natural energy. Weaknesses of the sanguine. They need to stand out. They want to be different. They're the ones that want to dress in the outrageous colors so that other people notice them. The melancholics, they want to dress in something that's going to blend in usually. They exaggerate. They're the ones who tell fish stories. Do they tell fish stories in Palestine too about the size of the fish? Well, and deep down they can really be shallow people sometimes. In other words, a lot of sanguines won't develop depth to their character. And uh, they're always showing you their emotions. 
or, or they can. That's a tendency. Again, these are tendencies. They're not automatic things they do. Uh, I love this one. They often enter the room mouth first. You can hear them coming. They can be scatterbrained. They're, you know, easily distracted all the time. And they can lack perseverance. They don't naturally want to finish a long-term project. That's hard for them. They can be allergic to work. They might not be very, they're not very disciplined often. In fact, my third child, my second son, is a sanguine. And we homeschool our children. I don't know, I don't know if you've heard of homeschooling. So uh, he, after eighth grade, decided he wanted to go away to high school because he realized that he was not self-disciplined. So he, he chose the toughest high school in town and started out with pretty low grades, and now he's a senior ready to graduate, and he's really upped his grades, but he wanted the influence of disciplined kids around him. So he recognized that, and we give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, it's easy for them to forget, uh, and they can be more inclined to vanity than other people. And they might, not, they might make decisions based on what they think other people will like instead of what they think is right or wrong. And then the final temperament, the phlegmatic, the golden retriever, they are incredibly dependable. They're prudent in making their decisions. They're sensible. They're loyal, committed, supportive. They're, they're like a rock. I had a friend who was uh, phlegmatic, and he says, yeah, we're stable. We're thick like phlegm. I'm like, really? <laughs> Do you know what phlegm is? That, that's the stuff that comes out of your nose when you blow your nose. It's like... Yeah, I guess he had to be a, yeah. Okay, they're very patient. They are by nature the most patient type. Uh, they also are okay with hierarchy. They just want to know where they fit in with the big scheme of things, and they're happy to live there. And they have common sense. They wouldn't need the sign that says, please don't sit on the crocodile. Uh, they're very balanced. They have great empathy. So we are often attracted to friends who have the opposite temperament. So I've noticed through my life a lot of my best friends were phlegmatic, because that's the opposite of the choleric. They would listen to me while I talked. They would give good advice. They would be very supportive. Phlegmatics are wonderful people to have around. Weaknesses, you know, if there's conflict, they just want to bury their head and ignore it. If, you know, why work if I don't have to? Uh, they can have a tendency toward being lazy. And they can often be overly conciliatory. In other words, they will give in to somebody else even if they were right. Um, they can give in too easily to peer pressure. Uh, they can be lazy. Also, they can be ninja worriers. They'll worry greatly about things. They might mumble and not talk too clearly, or they might be the classic couch potato, um, eating, watching TV. Uh, they can be indecisive. You know, they're, they're trying to figure out, okay, who am I trying to please here? Because they are people pleasers. Uh, okay. Now, everybody is a blend of two temperaments. No, virtually nobody is just one, and it's a good thing. Bec uh, and this was a, a priest who wrote on the temperaments back in the 1930s. He said, a person is happier if his temperament is not pure because your secondary temperament will help when your primary doesn't help you. It adds either a harder edge or a softer edge to your primary temperament. Okay, here we are with Winnie the Pooh. And I'm going to use uh, him and his friends quite a bit here in, in what I call the circle of temperament life. Everybody is along this circle. Winnie the Pooh is the classic phlegmatic. Tigger is the classic sanguine. Rabbit is the choleric. And the melancholic is Eeyore. Okay, so you can have a, your mixture is always going to be one of the temperaments next to you. So the phlegmatic can be mixed with the sanguine or the melancholic, but never with the choleric. The choleric can be mixed with the sanguine or the melancholic, but never the phlegmatic, and so forth. So everybody is a blend. So if we're looking at this, for instance, let's see, choleric. I live about right here. My wife lives right here. So she's Eeyore. Uh, she, no, she is... Uh, blah, blah, blah. No, my wife lives... Yeah, here, she's Eeyore with a little bit of Pooh, and I'm Rabbit with a little bit of Eeyore. And if you take the test online, it will tell you what your mix is. So the data from Catholic Match, quarter of a million people taking that test, 
had these mixtures in it. Uh, and you'll see that, uh, you know, the rarest one is the phlegmatic, ah, da, 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 da. Oh, well, never mind. That wasn't. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Okay, the uh, phlegmatic sanguine was the rarest. The most common is a sanguine choleric. There's a lot of sanguines, but everybody is going to be somewhere on this circle. Now, there are certain temperament mixes that, well, every temperament mix has a double dose of something. So, for instance, the sanguine choleric or choleric sanguines have a double dose of extroversion. They are really high energy oriented toward uh, people and projects. The choleric melancholic mixture, Shahinda, has a double dose of reason, passion, and perseverance. The melancholic phlegmatic mixture, like my wife, has a double dose of introversion. Both of those temperaments are introverted. And then the phlegmatic sanguine mixture is going to be the best for relationships, though they're most in touch with their feelings and developing harmony in relationships. So let's see, what time is it right now? 11.45. Okay, very good. So I will not go through too deeply into, I've got each of these, and the reason I left them on here is so that when Shahinda puts this online for you to look at, you can look at uh, this for your own temperament. But like the sanguine cholerics, these are the most extroverted people. They're charming, decisive, they're often entrepreneurs. They can talk you into anything. The choleric sanguine is incredibly goal-oriented but has excellent people skills. These are often, you know, chief executive officers of countries, uh, uh, companies, generals, uh, but they can be very vain. A lot of politicians are this type. Uh, the cleric melancholic, doubly passionate, doubly persevering. Th this is my type. Get the most done. It's not because I'm better than anybody. I'm just driven to do this, whereas I might be really bad at relationship developing like sanguines. So everybody's got a strength that can add to the good of other people. So the melancholic choleric has high goals and is driven to accomplish them. That's why Shahinda works in development. She's good for the university. She's right where she belongs. Uh, the melancholic phlegmatic, my wife, incredibly devoted to friends, will do anything for a friend, follows the rules, but has trouble with new situations. The phlegmatic melancholic, cooperative, pleasing, They'll get along with anybody. Oh, something I wanted to say about melancholics that's in, that I've noticed in my wife. They spend so much time worrying about what can go wrong that when something really big and bad happens, they are incredibly calm because they've already thought it through. So like in the middle of the night, we've had a couple of times when our basement has started to flood. Now, I don't wake up really well in the middle of the, my, the night, so I said, honey, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. She's calm as can be, not phased at all. So that's a great gift of melancholics. Very calm under pressure, as are phlegmatics. And so you can read about these. Okay, this, is, uh, this really helped me out. When do we use our primary and secondary temperament? We use our primary temperament when we are comfortable, when we're at peace, when we feel safe. That's the way we act, when we want to look our best. We use our secondary temperament uh, when our primary isn't working. So for instance, as a choleric melancholic, when I was in medical training and just a student and I was under other people, you know, my choleric tendency would be to say, hey, you're wrong, you know, to a, an attending, or how can you do that to us? But I knew that I would be quickly kicked out of med school if I kept doing that, so I would revert into melancholic mode and just be very thoughtful and listen. So that served me well. But when does stress come? Stress comes when neither our primary nor our secondary temperament can help us. So as a choleric melancholic, I have none of the relationship side. So if I'm in a situation where there's people angry at each other and I'm in a group where there's a lot of unhappiness, I need somebody else who's strong in those areas. I cannot naturally do that. It took me, even as a physician, it took me years before I could just calmly lay my hand on a patient's shoulder because that just wasn't part of my upbringing or part of who I was. I had to watch people who were sanguine and phlegmatic interact with others to see what they did to know, okay, this is, this, this is how I'm supposed to act because it just doesn't come naturally. 
Whereas, you know, a sanguine phlegmatic would look at me and say, really, you don't know what to do? Yeah, really, I don't know what to do. But they don't know all the thinking and effort that goes into other stuff I do. So we've all got blind spots that others can help us with. So that's when we're stressed, when neither temperament helps us. And that's when we can learn from our friends and family who have those temperaments. For instance, a sanguine phlegmatic, don't give them a big project to do on their own. It's not going to get done. And don't put a choleric melancholic in charge of a highly sensitive human relations situation because it'll probably get worse unless they have a lot of experience, a lot of training, a lot of development in their life. So that's why we need, that's why it's good in marriage to have somebody with a complementary temperament. That's why often our best friends have a complementary temperament. So my wife is a melancholic. She realized later on that almost all of her friends had been sanguines, which is, you know, the happy-go-lucky. She needed that in her life. And we need to develop complementary virtues. And sometimes the best thing we can do under stress is to just keep our mouth shut. It says this sign, sometimes my greatest accomplishment is keeping my mouth shut. And uh, for us extroverts, that's often true. As I said before, there are impossible blends. It's impossible to be an opposite. You can't be a choleric phlegmatic. Why are they opposite? The choleric has a strong immediate reaction. A phlegmatic has no initial reaction. Cleric's reaction lasts a long time. Phlegmatic goes away quickly. You, you can't have both at once. They're opposites. And the same with the sanguine melancholic. The sanguine's constantly changing up and down. The melancholic, very slow. Now, this talk should be more than mental massage, more than just learning something that's interesting. There are practical applications in our personal life. Um, and in relationship with others. And with others, we can understand other people better and learn their language of charity, their language of love. What means love to them? And develop better relationships. Uh, I love these quotes from Catherine of Siena's dialogues. Sister might be aware of them. Uh, but she said that God, uh, this is writing what she heard God say to her. He said, I distribute the virtues quite diversely. I don't give all of them to each person. One to one, one to, some to others. I shall give principally charity to one, justice to another, humility to one, faith to another. And so I've given many gifts and graces, both spiritual and temporal, with such diversity that I have not given everything to one single person. No one person can have all the temperaments. And she, he did it so that you may be constrained to practice charity toward one another. I have willed that one should need another and that all should be my ministers in distributing the graces and gifts they have received from me. And one of the gifts we've received is our temperament. So to become better human beings, we can, we're drawn toward certain jobs. Clerics might be drawn toward being entrepreneurs or businessmen, CEOs, lawyers, military leaders. To a cleric, charity means being loyal. Of course, my wife's a melancholic. Melancholics are, are naturally loyal. Well, that was a big natural attraction back then. A cleric likes it when you say thank you. Not, not overly expressed, just that you notice what I did. And uh, this, of course, is the end of Star Wars Episode Six. They want to be told they were right, if they were right. So this is where Darth Vader is saying to Luke, tell your sister you were right about me. Uh, clerics, how do we react to stress? We tend to roll over people. We're not very empathetic under stress. Like uh, when I'm operating and something's gone wrong with a patient or one of my nurses is doing something wrong, I can get stressed out very quickly and not be at all concerned about what my nurse is feeling. <sighs> I'll come back to her later and apologize if I do that. <laughs> so uh, we often have a deficit in understanding the emotional states of others because we're not really locked into our emotions as clerics. Uh, yes, we could write the book, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. Can it, clerics need to learn how to do small talk. You know, this says, all we ever talk about is the weather. You know, she's not happy. Uh, we need to learn how to relax. Uh, we need to learn how to forgive. We need to appreciate others and show empathy. As I said before, you don't need to motivate a cleric. What you need to do, because we're inherently highly motivated, you have to show us the right direction to put our energy in. So the car is always moving. You just have to steer it the right way. We need the right goal. We want to know why we should spend our energy on this instead of that. And if you're trying to motivate a cleric, just tell them, I bet you can't get it done this well or this quick. Uh, 
you know, we love that kind of stuff. And give rewards. Best jobs for a melancholic. Accountants, writers, uh, working in a laboratory. In fact, my wife worked in a medical laboratory doing blood tests. Engineers. I went to an engineering college, and uh, almost all of them were, were melancholic, very focused, very quiet, very introverted. Um, accountants are often melancholics. I won't bore you with that joke. OK. Uh, the teachers, psychologists, best jobs also. Many of them are artists, administrators. They do like cupcakes. Uh, research. They like uh, uh, photography. Anything requiring precision and detail-oriented work, a melancholic is the best person often for the job. What means charity to a melancholic? They won't believe it because they, see, they not only see faults in you, they see the faults in themselves very well. So you have to keep telling them, I love you just the way you are. You know, I keep telling my wife that, oh, no, you don't. don't. Oh, no, you couldn't. But I did this and this. It's OK. I love you. No, no, I don't deserve it. It's, oh. So oh, this is one of the things to my wife. Love is a clean, horizontal surface. Melancholics like things orderly in, in all ways, orderly in space and orderly in relationships. That would be fairness. So they want social order, physical order. They want to be understood. How do melancholics react to stress? They get discouraged uh, easily. Want to bang their In fact, my wife did this move last time. I was FaceTiming or Skyping her last night, and I told her one of the things I did at one of the holy places, and she just went Ugh, right into the computer. So I get that from my wife quite a bit. They'll withdraw from a situation uh, if they're stressful and just go off alone. They'll, they may want to blame others, and they might get depressed easily. Thank you for staying. I understand. That's why I'm thanking them for making the time they could. Uh, melancholics need to learn to see the forest for each thorny tree, to spend some time alone to re-energize, and uh, to not have a melancholic dump. Okay, a melancholic dump is, is frightening and fearful if you ever see it. Because melancholics can take a lot of, a lot of um, bad stuff. And they just soak it up. No, it's not bothering me. Oh, this isn't bothering me. And all of a sudden, everything bad that they've been absorbing and not letting out will come out all at once. And if you're in the neighborhood, it's all going to come out on you. Well, this happened, and you did this, and he did this, and I can't stand it anymore. It just all comes out at once. That's why you've got to get him to talk once in a while so that they don't let, let all these horrible things that have happened to them just store up and all this anger just build up and come out in a torrent. How do you motivate a melancholic? Well, first, don't give them a huge goal. Give them smaller parts. When something's going wrong, and I'm still learning this from my wife, listen. They don't want you to solve their problems. They just want you to listen. And, you know, as a cleric, I want to solve the problem. So just listening is hard for me. I have to realize that listening is solving the problem. And I have to acknowledge her worst fears and obstacles because usually I've got the big idea, we're going to do this, and then she's stuck with all the details, uh, like uh, having the brothers, the Franciscan brothers over to the house or hosting a fundraiser or something. So it's really easy for me to have this grand idea and for her to do it, so I have to acknowledge the obstacles. Uh, I have to let, let her let the small stuff slide. It's really okay, honey, this isn't that big a deal. Like, who was coming over? There was somebody coming over, and she had to have, oh, a grandson who's 10 months old was coming over, and she had to have the house spotless. He's not going to notice, honey. He's not, I remember when I was 10 months old, Grandma's house had dust on the floor. No. Uh, encouraged confidence in God. And, oh, a lot of times it's really to the melancholic, don't just sit there, do something, because they're stewing about what's the right thing to do sometimes. Now I do the happy-go-lucky sanguine. What are their best jobs? Salesmen. You know, a lot of salesmen are sanguines. Uh, PR, not Puerto Rico, which this is from, but public relations. They like being in public relations offices, like, well, Dimitri. <laughs> are you a sanguine, Dimitri? Oh, okay. Well, we'll find out. But there's often a lot of sanguines in offices like that. Uh, they direct choirs, they're coaches, they're teachers, entertainers, uh, other jobs. These are the people, like in a business, you want answering your phones or at your front desk 
because they will make a good impression on just about anybody. Uh, insurance salesmen are often that. Interior designers, uh, teachers, uh, real estate workers, tourism workers. So your, your um, hotel management tourism, they probably have a lot of sanguines that are naturally attracted to that. Okay, to a sanguine, what is joy? If I'm working with a sanguine, I have to be joyful around them some of the time or they're going to get dejected. They are fueled by other people's emotions. I have to be enthusiastic around them. Can't always be serious or they will lose hope. Love to them means social gatherings. You know, don't just give them work to do alone. In fact, that would be the end of, end of them. And, and you, know, motive, you know, you can do it. You've got this one. They, they want to hear that. They want encouragement. And they need and want help with the details. They are not good detail people. The melancholics are the best detail people, for instance. Sanguines need to learn how to persevere because oftentimes they're excited, but remember that excitement doesn't last long, so it doesn't carry them through a project. So they need help persevering and need short-term goals to get through something. Uh, so encourage them to finish what they started and encourage them also not to exaggerate so much. They are the best at naturally exaggerating. If you, you know, sometimes it's a fun exercise I've done and you have someone with each temperament witness something and then each, each of them tells the story to the group and the story comes out different from each one. Reactions to stress. Sanguines will seek a distraction, something to have fun with. St. Peter, he was a sanguine. And after Jesus uh, uh, rose from the dead, what did he do? He went fishing again. I thought he gave up the fishing thing, but he goes back fishing with them. They'll flee the situation. Like again, Peter. Peter was uh, leaving Rome. This is a famous, you know, quo vadis, where are you going, Peter? And uh, Peter was fleeing Rome during the persecutions under Emperor Nero and had a, a vision of Christ saying, uh, where are you going? And so he turned back and was crucified in, in Rome. Uh, they will tend to blame others, make excuses. And so they need to learn to push forward with discipline, to learn that hardships are a part of life. And St. Peter did learn that, to remember why they're doing what they're doing. And they need to learn to develop a deeper intellect. They've got the relationship down. They need to have uh, the reason down. Otherwise, they can become intolerant and exercise a real biting, mean humor toward others and become impatient workaholics. To motivate a sanguine, you've got to walk through them. Any project uh, that you give them, little hand-holding is actually desired by them. And they tend to want to choose based on what other people will like, not based on right or wrong. So they need to develop their own internal um, conscience uh, better. And sometimes you have to set up a schedule for them or details with them and reward with short-term goals. And this is a way, you know, raising sanguine children, educating sanguine students, having a, a new sanguine employee. And then finally, the phlegmatic. Best jobs. Mechanics, they often love that. They have great patience, great hands-on skills usually. They're often good research scientists because they have the patience to go through these long-term projects. Pharmacists, diplomats, excellent if they're sanguines. Teachers, engineers, carpentry, anything requiring calm under pressure, they are the most calm naturally of any type. It's really hard to phase them. And I've realized when I'm talking to patients, for instance, I can see almost anything to a phlegmatic, they're not going to get mad at me. Whereas if I have a cleric woman in the office, I have to be really careful not to set off her anger button. If I have a melancholic patient in the office, they want to know all the details and they'll have a long list of questions, so I have to prepare for that. And the sanguine, they don't care about my credentials or the procedure. They just want to know if they like me. So I'm usually joking around with them. So each type of patient I will interact with differently so that they are comfortable. Best job for a phlegmatic, computer programmers, firemen and police officers, military officers. They like working traditional roles within a fixed hierarchical system, and they are great and they are happy. What is charity to a phlegmatic? Charity is motivating them only positively. Because if you try to push a phlegmatic, he will become an immovable object. You never, never try to motivate by yelling with that type. It just, it, they don't react. They will just become like that. Like one of those Easter Island heads, the Rapa Nui, yeah. <laughs> So positive motivation, you got to show them something that appeals to them. What appeals to them? Peace and harmony, good relationships. How will this do that? 
stress to a phlegmatic leads to procrastination. And distraction. If I had a dollar for every time I got distracted, I wish I had some ice cream. It's too easy for them to get distracted. They're indifferent. They're uninspired. They're not naturally enthusiastic about things. They need to learn to focus on motivation and to express their needs and preferences. Because once you know a phlegmatic's needs and preferences, it's a lot easier to motivate them. Well, you like this? Well, look at, look at this over here. Some people need more motivation than others. And they need to learn, believe it or not, healthy eating and exercise. Oftentimes, they are more overweight than other times because they're not motivated to action naturally. So good food, good exercise. But they do need to learn how to relax alone. Even motivational tapes can help. And to be accountable to somebody else. And what's charity to them? A lot of times when we are trying to praise people, we just say these short things. These don't mean a whole lot. These kind of phrases do. They're the why. Why was it a great job? Because I like the way you kept trying even when the problem became harder. Why am I proud of you? You went back to check your work. That extra step was a great idea. So when praising people, especially the phlegmatic, they like the, okay, why was this good? Goal their own instead of yours. Praise them concretely. And sometimes they think there's absolutely no way through this wall, so you have to help them over the wall, help them overcome obstacles and help them to develop confidence. And repeat, these are your strengths. This is why you're going to be able to do this. Setting up accountability. Re do this and then report back to me. And again, short-term goals work with that. Now, there's, I've got three more hours I could talk about. I want to stop there and see if you have any questions um, about anything I've talked about so far. Yes. I can hear you. Okay, um, oh. First, I'd like to thank you for this wonderful, joyful lecture. Um, my question is, how do you relate it to faith to one of the temperaments? Faith to the temperaments? Well, that's the, the whole next section is on virtue, and then I have uh, different saints that are associated with different temperaments. So there are saints that... Um, I want this come back on. There we go. Let me see if I can go forward to that part. Uh, but a, a saint could have any virtue. Let's see. What, so, for instance, you know, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the, the uh, Jesuits, he was a cleric. Saint Jerome, of course, who was in Bethlehem here. Uh, he was a cleric. Uh, St. John Bosco, founder of the Salesians, was a cleric. Um, and then St. Uh, Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, St. Edith Stein, they were melancholic clerics. Uh, St. Padre Pio was a melancholic cleric. Uh, St. John Henry Newman was a melancholic phlegmatic. St. John the Apostle was a melancholic phlegmatic. Uh, what, what specifically are you looking for? Because you mentioned that if you want to motivate the melancholic, you have to talk about things that you can do to motivate the melancholic. Well, I mean, that can... A, a melancholic, for instance, um, has to learn to rely on... I mean, we all need to learn to rely on God. But melancholics um, need to develop a closer relationship because they're more oriented toward ideas and worries than relationships. So they need to develop a, a deep relationship with God to help them to develop, you know, virtues. For instance, the virtues a melancholic needs to develop are those of a sanguine, being outgoing, friendly, uh, accommodating to other people, uh, showing enthusiasm, showing joy. And a melancholic can do that better if they're motivated through their relationship with God, knowing them as a, a friend, in, instead of as being fearful. Yes. I don't know if there is a perfect mix. Uh, I, I think it's best that there, because 
My wife and I, for instance, overlap at melancholic. I am primary choleric, secondary melancholic. She's primary melancholic, secondary phlegmatic. So, so we've got three different temperaments there, but we have something that we really match on. And a lot of couples that I've known seem to be that way. There, there seem to be three between them. They, they match on one, and then they have two opposites, which, which is good. If you, and then there are other couples who say a choleric melancholic and then a sanguine phlegmatic, where everything's opposite and nothing is shared. You're initially attracted to that, but after a while when you're living close together with somebody else, if the other person's always messy and you're always clean, or one person's always loud and you always want quiet, that becomes very difficult. So um, I've not seen this written down. Just from my observation, I would say it might be best that you overlap on one. But, you know, love can overcome anything, but some might need more work because of that. If you're exactly the same, then you don't, then remember what I said, stress comes when neither of your temperaments help you in a certain situation. Well, my wife's phlegmatic side really helps with relationships because I can be tone deaf with those and she can be really helpful. So I'll, I bounce things off of her all the time to get her advice because I, I value that. But if we were both the same, we'd both have the same blind spots. So I think it's good to share some and good to have something that's different. That's just personal. Was this at all interesting or helpful? I mean, do you want to take the test to find out where you are? Yeah, yeah and, and, it's, and it's free. Uh, some people just asked, they took the test and they told me they were uh, surprised how accurate it was, whether it yeah. was true. Oh, you, you can predict so many things. It, it, that's why I say it's not putting you in a box, but it's just the way we're naturally wired. So sometimes you have to suppress a natural reaction because it's, it's not right to be really loud and excited, you know, in a certain situation. Or sometimes it's not right to keep your mouth shut and you need to talk. Uh, but yes, I think it will really help you understand yourselves. I wish I had known this when I was your age. Oh, I wish I would have known it in, um, in even high school because people are so caught up with trying to be for instance, popular. Well, guess what? The popular kids are mainly going to be the sanguines. I didn't have a chance at it. If I'd known that's the way I was made, I wouldn't have worried about it so much. Uh, and so it can be very freeing to know, to know your temperaments. So, yes, sir. That, that's a good question because being in medicine, I like seeing research papers on a number of different things, and there aren't many research papers. It's it literally started over 2,000 years ago. It was, it was through observation and seeing that certain patterns would fit, and they do fit. So all I can tell you is, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, it... it it, it explains behavior. So it's, it, 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 again, it's scientific. It's by observing how people react. And uh, I think because it does work, it, it, it's right. And it's right because it, it predicts how someone will behave. And it will not change. It's not a question or a yawn or both. <laughs> yes. Correct. Oh, is it, is it genetic? Um, you know, that is a good question. It's physiologic. You're right, some of them don't have the same, but it's the way they're born. It's the way that they, their makeup is. And, you know, the question is, how much role does the soul play in that? Because I think temperament, temperament might be kind of a meeting place for the body and the soul, because each soul is unique, too. And you don't inherit the soul from the parent, just the body. So I... I wouldn't be surprised if there's a mixture. That's a good question. I don't know how to answer that. But I'm so glad we ended up with some sanguine kids. It makes life at home much more enjoyable. Um, Dr. Thomas, the group is going to be here in a few minutes. I'll take my time taking them upstairs, so I'll, I'll buy you 10 minutes. Oh, I don't, yeah. I'm, what time is it, Dimitri? It's 12.10. Oh, okay. So we're still good.
I'm assuming I'll see you there. Oh, yes. Shane will help take care of me. Thank you, Dimitri. And you had a question? Exactly. Because sometimes we don't know how to, for example, if we don't like a certain person, it's not because we're not good, but because we're not understanding a communication way with our differences. It, you know, in, in this part of the world where you have far more problems relationally than we do, it, it eliminates one layer of possible difference that doesn't need to be there. And, and that's the way we're wired differently. I used to get mad at people who wouldn't, you know, hurry up and keep on time. They just aren't wired that way. So it helped me be more patient. It's like, okay, they're not like me, and it's okay that they're not like me. Uh, you're right. It's so helpful. It really reduces frustration with other people. Because, you know, oh, he's just, he's saying, when, okay, I get it. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to try to change them. I'm going to enjoy what's good about them. Any other questions? Yes. Me, as a choleric, um, I really have a difficulty tolerating with people who are more like magnetic. Yes. So I, I really can't stand it. So if there are any advice on phlegmatics, like, oh, uh, yes. Um, like I can explore just listening to the sometimes in the like slow and then like, okay, the point is. <laughs> Yes, why say something in 10 words when you can use a 1,000 words? Yes. I mean, I mean, sometimes you can say, you know, you know what, what's the bottom line? Like when I did my surgery training, my boss was much more choleric than I was, and he was always bottom line, bottom line. Uh, first, first of all, if, you ask, if you're going to ask them a question, ask them for a very focused answer. Don't give them open-ended questions too much. Uh, unless you have the time and you're willing to spend it there. What are the situations when you get frustrated with phlegmatics, people? Like when they react towards like problems and they're trying to find a solution and the solution takes so much effort and time and you know, there's always an easy way to do it. They would always choose the hardest way. And you want things so fast and... Right, because and cholerics naturally think faster than any other type. And, and, and deeply through things. So realize they're not going to, and then, so just propose your idea to them that you think might be better and ask them what they think about that. But that would be considered as like elegance, right? Wouldn't that be considered as rudeness for me to, because I would get so impatient? Well, it depends how you are. You might be really impatient inside, but it, what matters to them is not the inside, it's how you're acting toward them. So are you, you know, you could just try to say calmly, and that's the hard part for clerics is to, we think we're being calm and we're not coming across. That, that's a lifetime project for us. But just say, have you ever considered this? What do you think about this idea? So to propose a different idea is not rudeness. You know, to say that's dumb, well, that might be rude. <laughs> so, so it's all in the delivery, as my wife continues to tell me throughout my life. So it's, and sometimes it's not so much even what you say, it's how you say it. It's how your face looks. Like practice in the mirror talking to a phlegmatic sometime. And you'll probably see that you wouldn't like to see yourself talking to you that way. Uh, and sometimes uh, what can help is to role play with other people, you know, who are phlegmatics. In fact, I did this, I did some training for our, uh, our Catholic Medical Association for the leaders from around the country last summer. And we did some of that training and we'd have dip, different people, temperament types working together. It was very eye-opening to learn how to do it. But I think that the, one of the key things is your attitude toward them. Do you, are you doing this out of love and concern for them or just because you want to get out of there and it's frustrating you? I guess you have to start looking at the, the good of the person also, which is hard if you're in a hurry. And sometimes if you are in a hurry, you just have to say that. I'm, you know, I really need to go. But it, it, it's not easy because they are different. But sometimes they can be your best help. When you're feeling down or something, they'll listen. They'll support you. They'll always be there for you. They're usually very loyal. Now, be, people can, you know, not everybody has the same amount of virtue. Some are better than others. So a phlegmatic without much virtue that's going to be hard. A phlegmatic with a lot of virtue, you know, 
they're going to be easy. You'll come to a meeting point because you have to realize your way isn't always the right way. And that's hard for us clerics to say, oh, I can go with someone else's idea. You know, like when we're even we're on this tour, I'll say, oh, there's something over here. And I have to say, no, I just have to be quiet about this. So like I said before, sometimes the best thing I did today was keeping my mouth shut. Sometimes that's the best thing we can do. Other questions? Yes. Um, if two people does not like each other completely, does that mean their temperaments do not overlap? No, there's so many different things in relationship be besides temperaments. I mean, you can dislike someone with the same temperament, you can dislike someone with an opposite temperament, so no. You can dislike someone because what they value in life is different. Uh, for instance, there's another um, talk I've heard on the four levels of happiness. You know, the bottom level of happiness are your, you know, physical pleasures, you know, eating, drinking, you know, physical relationships. Second level is uh, competitive things. You know, I got a high score on my test. I won the race. And a lot of people live their life at that level. I have more money than you. And if you're just living at those levels and you're at the third or fourth level, the third level doing good for others and the fourth level seeking, you know, supreme truth, goodness, beauty, unity with God. If you're living on that level and someone's living on a, the lower level, you're probably not going to see eye to eye on a lot of things. So that can be um, a reason not to like somebody too. So there's many reasons not to like somebody. Now, sometimes certain temperaments can rub you the wrong way. The least liked temperament by other temperaments is the cleric. We are the least liked. You know, it's just unfortunately the way it is. The most liked is the sanguine. You know, they're happy, they're warm. So, um, now people, don't, yeah, people, if you don't like me, it's probably because I'm a cleric, but, you know, if you don't like a sanguine, there's something going on there. No. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, do I need this? So when do we draw the line between temperament and character? Because you said that they're different. Right. Again, the temperament is the reaction pattern, how you are stimulated to react in a certain situation. So like if someone comes in here and, um, and says the building's on fire, you know, some of us are going to run more, but uh, the clerics are going to try to organize people to get them out. The melancholic might think, that they, okay, what's the best way? to safely get everybody out. The phlegmatic will be the one, fire, fire. Oh yeah, I know what that is. And the sanguine is, wow, I was in a fire once, let me tell you about it. So we'd still all react, be, we'd have an internal reaction that we may or may not express. So our character determines how we express what our internal drive is to do at that time. So our, we can modify how we do that, but the initial internal experience of how we receive Something we see, something we taste, something we hear, something we read about, that's always going to be the same. Our character is what modifies how it comes out. Did you have a question? I really appreciate you taking time out of your day as students. I think that's pretty remarkable. And I really like what Bethlehem University is doing here, so I really admire you for... Uh, being here and doing this. So my hat's off to you.